begin with a, uh, with a, with a story. Um, okay. So Anne, Anne was a, she was an author. An author of popular uh, novels, maybe some of you have heard this, the, uh, the Vampire Chronicles. No, I don't know, Vampire Chronicles, yeah. So she was an atheist, later became a Christian, joined the Catholic Church. And uh, was in the church for 10 years, and then after 10 years as a believer, she decided that she could no longer continue to be a part of the local church. And then in July 2010, she wrote the following words. I'm going to read to you the full um, paragraph, okay? And said like this, Today, I quit being a Christian. I'm out. I remain committed to Christ, as always, but not to being Christian. Good to you. It's simply impossible for me to belong to this quarrelsome, hostile, disputatious, and deservedly infamous group. For 10 years I've tried, I failed, I'm an outsider. My conscience will allow nothing else. In the name of Christ, I quit Christianity. My faith in Christ is central to my life. My conversion from a pessimistic atheist lost in a world I didn't understand to become an optimistic believer created and sustained by a loving God is crucial to me. But following Christ does not mean following his followers. Christ is infinitely more important than Christianity. <laughs> it's, it's like, see, that's a, basically saying, I no longer go to church, I'm going to remain committed to Christ. It's weird, yeah? In the name of Christ, I quit Christianity. Wow. I don't know how to make up that. But there is a phenomenon going on right now. People are leaving church not to get away from God, but to find God. They are the so-called the revolutionaries. They say, I don't go to church, I am the church. A little honey, it's very, it sounds very spiritual. So how do we um, um, you know, respond to this type of people, believers? Is it really possible that we separate Jesus and the church? I think it's like saying, you know, let's say a guy had a, a year long, two years relationship about to marry a girl. And then she said to the uh, to his wife to be, you know me, because every, every, in Surabaya everybody's called me, me, right? Uh, me, cinta kamu, koko cinta kamu, right? You know, I like you, you know, I adore you, I love you. But, me, if you are going to move forward with this wedding, if you want to get married, you need to know that I don't want, ever want to see your mother, your father, your sisters, your brothers, your cousins, or any of your family members again. Can you marry me under these conditions? Of course, see, she can't, right? So, as troubling as that sounds, I do believe that God and church comes in a package deal. Jesus and the church comes in a package deal. God wants us to be united. I know it's not easy. Sometimes we have lost, perhaps, what is the meaning of that unity in the spirit. Today, I'd like to just remind all of us today the beauty of the unity that Christ has brought for us and the vision of unity in the spirit. Let's open our Bible to 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12 until verse 13. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 13. I have it up on the slide. Um, let me read for all of you. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 sampai 13. This is the Apostle Paul. This is the Word of God. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. 
Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Amen. When it comes to talking about unity, and when, when we read passages like this, normally, people would simply understand, okay, church is not perfect. Church has so many different types of people, different personality, different skill, different backgrounds. And so, we must respect each other. We must uh, share our gifts. We must make the, make the church work. You know, it's a place where every member has something important to contribute. That's it. <laughs> Basically, you want to talk about unity, that's it. That's as far as it goes. Everybody is important. Everybody got something to contribute. So let's do it. Let's do the church. That's it. Right? Ujung-ujungnya, muter-muternya cuma di situ aja. Yeah? At the end of the day, it's just some, something like that. Everybody is special. Everybody got something. Let's go. But, I'd like to remind you today and explore the Word of God. It's actually more than that. Two things today for you. Thank God, right? Just two. Usually I have like, I don't know, 25. There's two points, right? About unity. What, what, what Paul is teaching is it's deeper than just everybody special, everybody kind of contribute. No. Number one, it says that unity is something that is given. Where do I find that? In verse 12, if you follow along the statement, I mean the sentence, it goes like this. For just as the body is one, and has many members. And all the members of the body, though many, Paul keep repeating, right? Many, one, one, many. And but it's the same. So, this is the, this is the main point. This is the uh, home run, okay? So it is with the church. No. So it is with? With Christ. With Christ. So this is a, it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a twist ending. We would, Expect, okay, so many members, we are one, we are many, so it is with the church. But it's saying, no, so it is with Christ. What's going on here? Paul is talking that Jesus is made visible here on earth through the church. One scholar, I forgot who said this, he said something like this. Jesus died and he was raised through the church. Jesus mati. You can't see him anymore, right? But today you can still him. He arose again. He abangkit lagi. Where do we find that? In the church. Another way to put it. Today Jesus has a body. You and I are his body. That's what Paul is saying. And if it's not clear, in verse 27, Paul made it very clear. Now you are the body of Christ. And each one of you is a part of it. Notice it says, you are the body of Christ. Not, you are as if the body of Christ. No. It's not, you are like the body of Christ. Itu cuma ibarat. But Jesus is saying something, Paul, uh, uh, Paul is saying something deep. No, no. You are. This is a reality. This is something that is given from God as a result of the power of the Holy Spirit. We are really the body of Christ. It is an objective reality that is being given to us. That means, in your warta, Pak Yaakob said like this, the church is not an organization, it's an organism. The church is not simply a gathering, it's a fellowship. I would say, because I want to add some cool statements as well. The church is not an institution, it's a movement. If you imagine an institution, it's like just static, right? Let's say you want to make KTP, you want to make driving like driver's license. You go to a specific place, an institution. You go there, you do your business, you come home, right? It's static, the imagine, standing there, standing still. That's not the church. The church is not an institution like that. The church is a movement. It is dynamic. It's going somewhere. It lives and breathes on a purpose. A couple of days ago, some of us went to Lawang for the head gathering. And Pak Yaakob basically gave us, you know, hey, what's we gonna do in the next 11 years? Because when he came in 2005, 
he had like a 25-year plan for rent. 25-year plan for rent. Okay. He imagined we would have our own Bible school. We have a family center for counseling. We make an album with Dave, right? So imagine we have our own music like JPCC, like uh, NDC. That's the vision. Okay. So we are not institution. We are not just, okay, just come, service as usual, and that's it. We are not offering services. We are not offering religious services. We are living with, with a purpose. And that's what church is supposed to be. The church is not simply a voluntary organization. Yes, we do decide whether to join this church or other church. I know that. I did too. have to make a decision. However, of course, there is a human side of it. But ultimately, the church exists and will continue to exist because of the gracious work of the triune God. Gereja akan terus ada karena anugerah dari Allah yang tunggal. Why do I say that? Well, in the past, I don't know, 2,000 years, how many, how many bad things happened in the name of Christ? So many, right? How many scandals that pastors and, and religious authority have made in the name of Christ? Countless. How many bad <clears throat> behaviors by Christians committed in the past 2,000 years? How many Christian marriages broke up? How many Christian businesses went to do corruption? How many? Countless. And yet today, Christianity stood still. Betul? Hari ini gereja masih ada, dong. Today, the church still stands. Today, the world population, 2.4, 2.1 billion are Christians. The largest number of followers in the world. Of course, we can argue about whether there are those who are true believers, but my point is, despite all the corruption, despite all the difficulty, despite all the trash in the church, God take care of the church. He took care of the church. On this rock, I will build the church. And the gates of hell, the gates of hell will not shake it. So when we do church, today when we do church, we're not playing our own game. We are doing something very holy. We are doing something that is already given to us. But let me go a bit deeper than that. Okay, so we are a reality. We are in it together. This is the plan of God since eternity. The church is God's plan A, not plan B. Okay? But one more step, I want you to notice the, the symbolism that Paul uses. He used the symbolism of body, right? Ubu. Now, when I research on this passage, I found out that when Paul said things like, hey, if you remember this, 1 Corinthians 12 is about, you've got eyes and ears, and if you can, if you've got a foot, you cannot say to the head, hey, head, you do not belong here, right? Ears. So Paul mentioned many body parts. Actually, that kind of understanding about the body is used in politics. So listen to me carefully. In the Greco Roman world, when the emperor or the ruler or the governor, whoever the guy in charge, he wants to say, hey, everybody get in line. Everybody gotta obey me. Why? Because I'm the head, you are my feet and my hands. Okay? So the body is used as a political tool. You've got to line up. You are just fit, you're just peasants, you're just weak and poor, stay at your stations. The nation is weak when you, the fit, want to become the body, uh, want to become the head. So don't revolt, don't rebel, just stay as you are. So, so, so in the greco roman world, they use the idea of body as a political vehicle to say, you've got to stay in line. Let the powerful be more powerful and the uh, weak remain weak because that's the way the nature works. But Paul used the same symbolism, metaphor, says the same. Yes, the church is like a body. But it's different the way we treat the body. That's why I love verse 22. Verse Corinthians 12. 
verse 22, for me is just amazing. Now when I read this part, please stay in your head the context of the Greco-Roman world, okay? When Paul said this, he said on verse 22, on the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Yang terlihat lemah itu malah paling dibutuhkan. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our presentable parts do not require. But God so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it. Wow, this is a counter-cultural teaching. Paul is saying we got to treat everyone, especially those weaker ones than us, with respect. With respect. If you notice as well, Paul does not want to have elitism going on in the church. If you look at verse 13, for example, he used one spirit, one body, one spirit again. All baptized, all were made to drink. See, the use of one and all, all and one. Not the musketeers, okay? <laughs> Basically, Paul is saying, hey, you guys in Corinthians, what, what's going on? They, 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 they divide themselves based on who've got the superior spiritual gifts. I can speak in tongues. You can't speak in tongues. So I'm more religious than you. God loves me more than you. Okay? So they create like a um, spiritual elite. And Paul is saying, no, 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 no. We all have the same spirit. We all go for the same purpose. That means... Paul is saying this, what may separate the world should not divide the church. The world make categories, classify people. Like here, they classify Jews or Greeks. They classify slaves or free, right? And those lines of separation becomes like a standard, okay? If he belongs to that category, he is somehow weaker. We don't want him. Or put him away. But what divide the church, I mean what divide the world, should not divide the church. Other place they can have their own classification. But here, we respect one another. Regardless of backgrounds, regardless of nationalities, regardless of languages, we belong to the same God. One example of this in a, in a real way, is happened during the World War Two. Uh, happened during World War Two. Um, the National Church of Germany at the time. They to make to, to simplify things. Okay, they basically supported Hitler. And you know, Adolf Hitler made classification, right? He systematically said, okay, some people are not worth it to become Germans. Basically, right? Some people are not, uh, they are less than human. The Jews, the weak, the, uh, the, the retarded ones, right? So they make classifications. Um, and that's how they kind of push their feet. And the church, ironically, supported him. But there's one German guy, he's very famous, by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer said differently. He said, he made another fellowship, he had an underground church going on, who run by a different principle. And this is what he said. I love one of his quotes by him. He said, every Christian community must realize that not only do the weak meet the strong, but also the strong cannot exist without the weak. The elimination of the weak is the death of fellowship. So when I read this, these are very two different guys. Hitler on one side and Von Hofer on the other side. Basically, Hitler is saying, hey, you want a strong nation? Easy, get strong people inside. Eliminate the weak. You want a strong organization? Get the strong, eliminate the weak. Von Hofer said, you want a strong organization? Get the strong to support the weak and the weak to support the strong. Very different. And which one wins at the end? Which one fell at the end? You know, it's like a paradoxical power, yeah? 
The vision of Christian unity is not keep the strong, eliminate the weak. But the strong must support the weak. And the weak must support the strong. And that's where society can become stronger. Powerful stuff. Powerful testimony. There is a a British, well, I think I think it's from the UK. I forgot. Anyway, um, he was an educated man. He was very privileged, and he was very smart. And then when he grew up, he became a physician, a doctor. He lived in such a upscale community. He lived with other, you know big names of his day, so perhaps if in Surabaya right now, he would be driving a Ferrari and hanging out with, 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 with you know, uh, Selectrams and all those people, and all the big names of the company, so that's that how he would present himself, because he's a leading physician of his day. And then, he got a sense to ministry. And so, his pastor now left medicine and high society to become the pastor of a small church in a poor area in the shores of Wales. And reflecting on this time at that new place, he said like this, you know what? He said, I had a lot of time chatting with fisher men and fisher women, he said. Just, you know, just everyday, ordinary life. And those conversations, he said, gave, gave me greater joy then deep conversations about science, history, and philosophy with the privileged people he had grown up with. So that fellowship opened his world. He's no longer a guy with few friends, few privileged friends, he's a guy with many friends. He can talk not only about history and philosophy, now he can talk about fish, <laughs> and trade, and, and, and ordinary lifestyle, right? Instead of being, um, you know, uh, tolerating the weak, he actually becomes someone who can love the weak, love other people, very different from him. And that guy is Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones. David Lloyd Jones, I think. Martin Lloyd Jones. One of the famous preachers of his, of the 20th century. He became like that because he knew that Jesus has welcomed him. Because Jesus is another from us, right? If you think about it, number one, Jesus is very different, right? Number one, Jesus is not Chinese, you know that, right? <laughs> Jesus does not have blue eyes, you know that, right? Okay, Jesus is not Piran, Jesus is not wrong, okay? Jesus is different, he cannot speak English, he cannot speak Mandarin, and I'm sure he will not be able to speak Java, Java, okay? <laughs> Jesus is very different than us, different time, different language, different background, different many, many things. And yet, he reached out to us. He welcomed us. And so we can welcome others as well. Unity is given. Secondly, oops. In verse 13, we, are, we, are, we got this verse. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews and Greeks, and free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Now, the trick here, not the trick, but the, here's one of the most difficult uh, verse in the book of 1 Corinthians. We've, because you've got this, okay, you've got baptized in, in one spirit, baptized, and drink of one spirit. What is that? Some said, oh, this sounds like second baptism. Right? So you've got baptized ones, and then you've got another baptism. The superior baptism. You know, I've been baptized, you know how many times? Three times. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've been baptized three times. First one, I'm baptized in a swimming pool. I forgot. <laughs> I was baptized in a swimming pool in someone's house. I forgot who had, whose house that is. But I was there. I was small. I didn't quite understand what's going on. Hey, it's a pool. So, <laughs> so yeah, I got baptized. Um, secondly, I got baptized in the house. Not with water, but with speaking in tongues. So someone actually prayed for me to get, you know, spirit baptism. Right? Spirit baptism. So everybody was, you know, yeah, I was in the room and then praying for me. And the result to be continued, yeah? This is not a sermon about that, okay? And finally, the third one, 
my final baptism, I hope there's no more, <laughs> is in the U.S. Somehow, my pastor at the time decided or, you know, came to a conclusion my first baptism and second baptism was not valid. <laughs> so, so I need to talk you into the water again. So I was, my last baptism was in the U.S. in the, in the yard of the church. So, <laughs> Uh, that's just a side story. Sometimes, you know, maybe it is, is this first thing about that, that we have like multiple baptism then, okay. Or, or maybe drink, huh? Drink, 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 right? So maybe this one is about baptized. This one is about communion. But, rather than being lost in the theology, in the grammar, and I know probably some of you have thought, why is this important? I don't care, just get to the point, right? So, uh, this is the point, okay? The point of these two, baptized and drink of the Spirit, is actually they are synonymous. They are saying of one, they are teaching of one event. By one Spirit, you are baptized, but also you drink every day. If you want to make it more, um, it makes sense in your head, think like a progress, okay? So, you are put in a new reality, right? Baptism. This is ancient baptistry. Looks nice, yeah? So it looks like a cross. So I was wondering if I can ask Pak Yahweh, we can make a... <laughs> go with the cross here. <laughs> and then baptize over there with the cross. Kind of cool, right? This, it like, you know, because baptism is we are dead in Christ, we rise with Christ, right? So the, the symbols of the cross. Kind of cool. Anyway, so uh, baptism, a new reality, and yet we drink, we continue to participate. So it's like this. Baptism happens only one. I mean, you don't get baptized all over again, right? But drink, you drink every day, right? I mean, yeah. the, just the image of drinking. So it's like, number one, it's something that we, we are in a reality. Number two, we need to participate in that reality. That's why I said the second point is, unity is something that we participate. Something that we, um, that change us. So unity is given by God. It's an objective reality. But at the same time, because we've been given the Spirit, we participate. The gospel of Jesus Christ is all about participation as well, <coughs> not just conversion. And why is this important? It is important from this story I'm going to share with you. Just a moment. Any difficulty breathing? No. <laughs> oh. Back in June 1893, as a young lawyer, he went into a train station, I mean, in a car, I mean, in a, yeah, in a train at uh, South Africa. Um, he was a first class lawyer, educated in Britain, admitted to the bar of England and Wales. He was from India, and he went to the first class compartment. So he had a First class, first class ticket. He sat down, and then moments after that, the, the, the train porter, I mean, you know, the guy who's like a, went around to check tickets on the train, he threw him, he threw, he, he threw him out of the train. Because this is first class compartment, you are an Indian, this, is not, this, does not, this place is not for you. This is white only. He had first class ticket. He was an educated man. He was, at that time, he was very mild-mannered, he was timid, he was politically disengaged, he doesn't care about politics. But that treatment, he got, he got thrown out of the train, awoke a sense of moral injustice, right? awoke a sense of moral conscience in, conscience in him. And this is something wrong. i got to fix this. i got to fight for this. And perhaps you know who this guy is. That young lawyer's name was Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. That's Gandhi over there. That incident had two big events for Gandhi's life. Number one, that's the turning point. The first time he became the champion for uh, human human equality. Okay. But number two, that is the time where he turned away from Christianity. Because the guy that threw him off was a Christian. Was a white Christian. 
is ironic. Gandhi was once traveled to Rome in the Vatican, and he said that the sacrifice of Jesus, he said it was a beautiful act. He said that I would I would bow down before the crucified one. That's what he said. Saya akan tunduk sama yang disalibkan. He called Christianity. He said joy can come not by joy can come by giving our life. That's what he said. That's like Jesus. But he got turned off by Christianity because Christians. As you know from the famous quote, I like your Christ, but I don't like your Christians. See? We need to participate in unity because the world is looking at us. And yes, bad people, bad Christians turn many people away from Christianity. Many people have to judge because of people like this Walter guy. And lo and behold, we don't have Saint Gandhi. We have Mahatma Gandhi, so right? But today I see another trend. Today I see even good Christians attend church less often. Church is not really, really important for Christians anymore, I think. There's a trend. I'm sure if I ask all of you, hey, have you turned out <laughs> a non-believer these days? No, no, you never know, right? Have you, have you, any, have you turned out a non-Christian these days? Of course not. We, won't, we, we are not that bad, right? But as good Christians, do we love the church? Do we participate in the church? I see good Christians today attend, can attend church less often. There's some many reasons, right? Number one, we've got more options. In the past, uh, travel by plane is expensive, right? It's a luxury. Now, you've got travel fare. <laughs> you've got cheap tickets, right? We've got options now. We've got money now. We've got uh, cheap deals now. I mean, come on, three hours church versus three hours Avengers, which one would you go? <laughs> I would go, well... <laughs> Yeah, we got options now. We got entertainment now. So people, yeah, it's okay. And, and, and I remember, I remember when I was small. If I skip church, I felt guilty. Like, like, like oh, why am I not in church today? Something must be wrong. <laughs> so I, I got, I, I got guilty for not being in the church on a Sunday morning. But today, it's not a big deal. Why don't you go to church? Oh yeah, because I've got things to do. Because my kids are not ready. Because you know, it's not wrong, but. You see, there's no guilty feeling anymore. It's just, yeah. If I can attend, good. If not, that's okay. Right? And now, we are also very um, self, we have a self-directed spirituality. Okay, I don't like this church. I don't like this preaching. It's okay. It's easy. I just open my YouTube, open my podcast, and I can find all, the, all my favorite preachers. Because look at that. The, the way he preached, he got like a like a T-shirt and a, you know and a, and a, 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 all, all the cool jeans and my pastor over there is is, is old. <laughs> so I, I can just customize my spirituality. You know the people I mentioned in the beginning of my sermon, the revolutionaries, the one that I don't I don't go to church. I have the church. They don't go to church, but they have fellowship together <coughs> with who? With like-minded believers. So basically, okay, I like you, I like you, I like you, I like you. We love, we love with Jesus, we come together, and in a way it's good. I mean, I'm not saying that it's bad. It's just that there's that's that's a, that's a phenomenon like that. So church is not a big deal. We have, we have, we have a group. But those are like-minded believers. Church is different, it's different, right? It's difficult here. And that is why Carson said, church, here we have, we are natural enemies, make friends. <laughs> Kita ini sebetulnya para musuh-musuh, saling -musuh, musuh-musuh, tapi jadikan teman karena Kristus. And perhaps why people, even Christians, attend the church less often. I think this is it. I think this is our fault, or at least from the church point of view. Perhaps people are seeing less and less value of being in the church. It's like there is no direct benefit. Compared to, let's say, you go to work, right? You go to work, you put in the hours, and what is the benefit? Gaji, right? Salary. You get something very concrete, right? Um, you wanna, you go to the gym, you, you ran, you go to do cardio for uh, how many hours, and you can actually uh, uh, measure. Okay, calorie to get the hundred percent, right? The calories uh, is okay. Now I can eat more donuts. Anyway, you know, but you see what I mean? You got, you got, uh, you got in, in almost other things out there. You got like a very concrete measurement. But church is very difficult, right? How do you measure 
Okay, I am more spiritual today than 10 years ago. How do you measure that? It's not easy. That's why coming to church, Sunday after Sunday, you can feel like, hmm, there's no therapy. You see what I'm saying? If people are not motivated with something concrete, it's very hard for us to be committed. I have this time, I don't know how, to, I don't know, make some sort of a evaluation for our church. Evaluation for us. Maybe before you came to Red, let's say, as an example, you don't like reading the Bible. But now, after, let's say, one week, hearing my preaching, <laughs> no, after one year, okay, after one year, you read your Bible every day. Five minutes, it's okay. But, yeah, maybe we need to start making that some sort of a measurement to give you the message that God is doing something in you. Unity is something that we participate. We cannot just stand back and relax. Now, I know, I know, I know church, it's very, it's very tempting to just retreat. It's very tempting to just have a faith, me and Jesus, and you guys, okay lah, once a week. But that's it, no more, okay? Because I can get stressed lah, right? <laughs> Just once a week is enough, okay? Uh, but me and Jesus, we, we are we are, we are tight, right? I know it's easy like that. I know it's just easy to do just the bare minimum. I know it's easy, especially with the people outside of Christianity who might, might not be very happy with what we are doing, especially now in Indonesia. I know, a lot of challenges, a lot of difficulties. And even here in the church, not, you know, you will have problems, you have Disagreements, people are not nice sometimes, often, always. I know. Uh, the, but here's the thing, though. Here's the thing. If we don't do anything, then things can get worse. Yes. Right? That's, that's, that's reality. For evil to flourish is simple. Just the good guys stop doing that, stop doing anything. Don't do anything, and the bad things will be stronger and stronger and stronger. So either we Persevere by the power of the Spirit to do something, to participate in this reality called the Church, the Body of Christ. Why don't we just sit back and relax and, you know, as situations go from bad to worse? Or do you want our church to be used to make a difference? To really uh, be a light and a salt unto the earth? That's my hope. And I'd like to close with a video, I hope you enjoy this. So just a, a background. You're about to see, long long siapkan you'll see ya. Lampunya bisa tolong dimatikan nanti ya, Mas Yafet ya. So you're about to see a video. These are strangers uh, gathering. These are not, uh, they're gonna sing, okay? And they are strangers. They don't know one another and they are not professional singers. Okay, and I want you to pay attention or enjoy or look at the reactions as they do this activity together. Okay, you also have to enjoy the video.
are strangers, okay? They're strangers. They are not obviously professional singers. Those are the type that likes to sing in the shower. Uh, car. And then they went to a pub. They went to a pub and this group called the pub choir. Well, kind of self-explanatory, right? Pub choir. So they got into groups of four, you know. Um, um, I mean, yeah. And they just sing. They just sing. Obviously the power of sound, the power of music, and a little bit the power of alcohol, obviously, because it's, it's, it's not pop, right? So, um, I mean, when you look at that, when you look at that, do you, you like our sons? Mm -hmm. That's how it is, yeah? Mm -hmm. Some of the people, they said, you know what, we go to church. I, one of the ladies in church said, yeah, we, in church, we see, we see a performance. We are spectators. But here, we are not spectators. Mm -hmm. We are part of the action. We are creating a sound together. I think that uh, should be the picture of the church, right? We are creating something together. See, and that, that by the way, that's in Australia, actually. Um, and they're going around the country and around the world to recreate that. So just, you know, but the, the point is, some, some, some of the interviewers, I mean, the, the interviewees, they said, that, you know, we are bored at home, we don't know what to do. I mean, these are, this is an experience that you cannot download. This is something that you cannot download. You can't get this on internet. You gotta be there. You gotta experience it. And this shows that community that, that people is thirsty of community. They need they want to see unity. And they enjoy unity. You, you see how they <laughs> you know how they they want like right? enjoying and just singing and they don't know that, that bad voice, each of them, bad voice, but together, look at the harmony. Because many of us say, I can't sing, I can't sing, Fallas, 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 don't worry. You in the middle of uh, yeah. 500 people, nobody will know. <laughs> but, but look at that. Look at the beauty of unity. That's a secular version, folks. That's a secular version right there. I pray that we have the church version. Amen. Let's pray.